uh, this year we propose a series which is called How, How Agri-Food Industry Uses Ontologies, and this is already the second webinar. We have the pleasure to welcome Stephanie Deboot, who will introduce us on how BASF applies ontology and encourages collective and collaborative curation of ontologies. And Bjorn Ust Hansen will guide us into the knowledge graph of KWS for gene discovery. Thank you for, for this opportunity. Um, I think it's a really nice initiative and I think it helps the whole community to, to come closer together. What I will um, do today is um, I will talk about um, how BSF and more specifically the seeds and trades parts of, of BSF uh, uses uh, ontologies. Maybe some of you are, are not uh, very familiar with BSF. Uh, I think if you know it, it's mainly because of its activities in, in chemical industry. And that's, of course, a, a very large part of, of BSF. Um, but here you see an overview of, of the different segments in, in which BSF is, is, um, is active. So next to chemicals, there's also work in, in materials. Um, for instance, the, the materials um, that are used to make the sole of sport, sport shoes, um, industrial solutions such as, as pigments or uh, surface technologies such as coatings, which are used in, in the car industry. Also in nutrition and care, there's activities where, uh, for instance, um, flavors or aromas uh, are being produced such that they can be used in, in human care uh, products. Today, I will focus on, on agricultural solutions and, and how uh, ontologies are, are used there. And agricultural solutions is, is to some extent relatively um, new activity within BSF. Um, so there's two main parts, uh, one being uh, crop protection, uh, which has been a long-standing uh, activity when, within BSF. Um, but since um, August uh, 2018, um, BSF Agricultural Solutions also has uh, substantial activities in seeds and trades um, with the uh, acquirement of a part of the seeds and trades businesses from, from Bayer. Um, so within seeds and trades, there's on the one hand the veg vegetable activities uh, where uh, we work on, on tomatoes, for instance, or on aubergines like you see in the pictures. And on the other hand, we work on field crops such as uh, soy, um, cotton, canola and wheat. So as mentioned today, I will focus on, on the seeds and trades um, part. In seeds and trades, but but just widely within within BSF, digitalization has been recognized as, as very important to, to all sorts of activities, be it in automation of processes in gaining efficiency or in um, um, developing new business models and providing better customer support. And there's so there's many opportunities. Um, that digitalization um, can improve the businesses. But also in, in R&D, um, digitalization is, is one of the main pillars within the strategy um, to, to bring R&D forward. And certainly in, in seeds and trades R&D, um, where a lot of um, different data types are being generated, we are confronted with, with many different challenges um, to actually allow data-driven decisions in seeds and trades. Just very simply put, on the one hand, we're generating lots of data um, within the company itself, but also, of course, outside of, of the company. Um, and on the other hand, um, we want to as efficiently and as quickly as possible analyze those data and, and make decisions based on those data. But in practice, um, we're confronted with challenges such as um, quickly finding and aggregating data across different data types or different studies, different environments, 
being fields versus greenhouse, for instance, and different R&D workflows or different groups within, within the organization. Also, there's lots of manual efforts in, in data cleansing or formatting, processing um, that occur over and over again when, when you do not uh, cover or handle data um, efficiently or properly. Uh, finding up-to-date and correct high-quality data sets uh, can be a challenge and having the flexibility and data access depending on the purpose, depending on your question, as well as the skills, the skill set of the people that need to access the data um, um, means that there's there are several challenges uh, to be addressed. So overall, um, when you look at, at, at data management and data integration, um, you can imagine that um, this kind of situation um, where you want to find data en route, um, but actually um, when you put this question very simply, then you can get all sorts of results um, that are mixed up um, and where you need a lot of time to, to actually dig into it, find the relevant data, um, find parse them in the, in the right format such that you, you can work with it. So that's typically the situation you have when you do not have ontologies. Because actually, when a computer uh, needs to understand your question, it can interpret the word root in, in many different ways. In a mathematical context, it might be uh, the square root. Um, in in uh, anatomy, it could be a root system. If you're looking at vegetables, it could be all sorts of, of different roots or carrots. So really, um, both humans and, and machines need to understand each other and need to understand the terms that we're using to describe our data. Um, and when we, when, when we can enable that, um, we should be able to, to cover a lot of aspects uh, and challenges um, that I was um, talking about earlier. Now in, in BSF seeds and traits, um, and I, I put this relatively simply, um, but there's lots of areas where ontologies uh, are needed to, to describe um, the provenance of data. So where is the data coming from? How was, was it generated? But who was, was it generated? Um, sequences of spe specific uh, data type, which is very important, um, needs to be described by ontologies. All sorts of experimental uh, data, um, experimental metadata, as well as the data generated by the experiments can be standardized by using ontology terms. And of course, um, re very relevant for this audience, uh, phenotypes, uh, one of the key data types that, that we generate, um, can, can make, have benefit of using ontologies. And here you just see a short list of, of ontologies, um, publicly available ontologies in green, uh, and some private ontologies, which we typically use um, for, for these purposes. So I won't go in, into detail, but I will give some a few examples later on. So overall, um, the main purpose today for using ontologies uh, and seeds and traits is, is to enable integrated data management and to make sure that, that the data is, is fair, that it's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, so really the need for a common uh, terminology for both metadata annotation, annotation as well as data standardization um, is what motivates us to uh, to do all these efforts in, in the ontology uh, field. So here are, are a couple of examples of, of how um, ontologies are today used in, in activities or in, in applications that are used for, for data management. Um, so here on the left-hand side, you see an example of how sequence sets are annotated using ontology terms. 
um, as metadata such that we can easily uh, know what the data are about and, and we can use those ontology terms to, to search and filter um, the data afterwards. So species is here an example, sequence type is another example. Similarly, um, for breeding data sets, for instance, we, we annotate those data sets with common crop names such that uh, a breeder does not need to work with, uh, with a scientific name all the time, but he can easily filter the data he's interested in based on the common crop name that he is familiar with and he, he uses um, in his daily work. Um, and the last example is in the standardization of, of phenotype data, where it becomes uh, more and more important to um, properly standardize your data such that it's not only findable, which is mainly enabled by the metadata, um, but it's, it's, it's actually also um, interoperable such that we can bring together uh, data sets um, from, from different sources. So this was a, a, a quite general introduction to how you use ontologies. Um, for the remaining part of, of the presentation, I would like to um, focus on customer focus um, because I think um, ontologies on, on its own it, it is not valuable. Um, you need your you need your customers to be engaged. You need to make sure that ontologies are used that they contain the terms that, that are relevant for your customers, um, such that you can really um, bring value um, to it. Um, and there's there's two, two ways in which I see customers here. Um, so on the one hand, it's it's the application. So I showed you some of, ex uh, some of these examples. So to be able to um, develop such applications which make use of ontologies, you need to make sure um, that these ontologies are easily accessible and, and maintainable um, such that um, traditional development teams can, can make use of them, of these ontologies easily. Um, so here is, 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 is an, a schematic view of, of this um, where um, within seats and trades we provide a common and central infrastructure uh, for managing our ontologies in, in different um, databases um, with one access point to it, such that all the different types of applications can make use of, of the same terminology. So the advantage here is that the applications individually do not take care of the, of the terminology and, and their own language or their own ontology, but they make use of, of a terminology which is, is common to, to all applications. And of course, the other um, big customer group are the data curators, um, people that, that enter data into databases, data scientists who analyze data, and ontology curators who, who contribute to the ontologies. And one way to, to enable them is, is to provide an ontology browser, which is the ontology uh, lookup service. Um, so we have um, a private instance of this EBI ontology lookup service, um, which, um, which displays the ontologies that, that we have on our platform. But that is, of course, uh, not sufficient. Browsing is one way to 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 see what what's available in the ontologies. You also need people that can contribute to to the ontologies, such that that they cover the terms um, that that are needed to describe the activities that we have. And then, yeah, ontology development, ontology creation is a continuous effort. Um, there's always new new things to be to be added. So. How to efficiently organize that is, is a challenge. Um, you can think of approaches where you have um, knowledge engineers or no, knowledge, um, knowledge scientists who, who do this kind of job, but, but very easily you, you run into bottlenecks where there's a limited number of people in your organization who can work on ontology creation and as such. Um, 
the yeah the process of ontology creation is actually not fast enough to to serve the customers. So that's why we we are building this ontology creator community where the philosophy is on the one hand to overcome that bottleneck of of a limited number of uh, ontology engineers or ontology um, um, developers, but to really uh, leverage um, the R and D community as a whole um, and identify ontology creators in that R and D. Uh, organization who have the extensive biological domain expertise, who have expertise on the data sets that they generate, and who can best um, identify what the priorities are for ontology creation. And those ontology creators then work together with a, a limited number of uh, ontology validators who do have more expertise on ontologies uh, themselves, on the technical aspects, um, but less on the biological domains expertise. Um, and then um, the, the third role um, that we that we have here is the ontology integrator who really pushes through the, the changes that were initiated by the ontology creators such that they are available by all the applications. So organizing this on the on the people level is one. Um, the other is providing the tools such that that you can have that you can en enable this community, because the more people you you engage, of course, the more complicated it it can become, and the more time you lose in in communication. Uh, so that's why we decided to to develop a tool um, which actually manages that curation workflow and which allows to track the communication between ontology curator and validator. And on the other hand, makes it very easy and very um, quick to, to add or request changes to the ontology and validate them and, and quickly add them to the platform. So finally, and this is, this is my last slide, I would just um, like to summarize that uh, in this experience, um, of course, consensus is an important part um, in ontology development. Um, but really, what what we what I try to emphasize here is that we try to, uh, as much as possible, rely on the public sources, um, but then engage our internal people as uh, as much as possible, such that we can curate um, the ontologies that we work with that we actually need. Um, and that's that from that um, it is um, clear what a what a benefit is uh, for our r and d activities. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie, for this great presentation. So now Bjorn Ostensen will uh, present us on the usage of ontology and knowledge graph at KWS. Thank you very much, and thank you for having us. It has been some very interesting talks. So first, like who is KWS? Well, unlike for example BASF or Bayer, uh, KWS is working basically only in seeds. We are our main business is sugar beet, corn, cereals, and some other field and vegetable crops. It's a relative old company as well. It started in 1856, um, so more than 150 years ago, and since then with sugar beet and since then different other crops has been added to the portfolio with vegetables as the last one last year. So 150 years creates a lot of legacy both on the personal level, history of the company but definitely also in processes and data. Um, we concentrate on three main business processes, the research and development of basically new varieties of plants, the production of seeds, seed coating, that's especially a big thing in sugar beet because the seeds are not well round. And then lastly, uh, advice to farmers. Many years of running a company creates a very complex data landscape and creates a lot of silos of data. 
Usually these ones are built for serving a specific purpose, for example, weather data, genomic data, field trial data, etc., etc. And very often over many years, these kind of solutions, especially before in time, they end up serving as these kind of big monoliths. It's very well for their specific purpose, but often making it difficult to move things across. So we have worked and are working a lot on basically trying to map, make mappings based on ontologies, both internal and external, to try to get this data on the same form so we can build these kind of knowledge graphs and actually aggregate data across platforms. So one thing that I think has been shown many times is that the collection of data and aggregating cleaning data is very time consuming and costly. What I found a little bit interesting here is as well that this is a figure from Forbes is also the least enjoyable task for employees. So by having easy access to clean data, one thing is you save a lot of time, but you actually also get happier staff. And I find that's a very valuable um, thing as well that is often not mentioned. One of the problems I have found very often when you have to mix data from different databases is that first of all, like here, I stole these pictures from Neo4j. Um, to go from Alice to what department she's in, you need these kind of intermediate tables. You need to do a lot of joins. Relational databases are very, very nice if you have stru very structured data, like measurements, gene expression, field trials. But when you have to go across the different databases, you can often run into trouble. Sometimes maybe they're not well documented. People use different IDs or different descriptions. And that's where, for example, the knowledge graph uh, can be a very big advantage, especially um, if you have new people coming in, then it's basically self-describing data. You can see which departments, as here, Alex belongs to the for future P0815 and A42, and that is directly connected to her. You don't have to look into other databases or other systems. Um, that also works very well for very fast prototyping in our experience. Um, but for that to work, of course, you need to have a lot of structure. You need to have ontologies. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit. So at KWS, I tried to make a little overview of not all, but at least some of the ontologies um, we are using. So we have this sequence on ontology for handling all data related, all metadata related to our internal and external sequencing data. Then we have the gene ontology that some of you probably know for functional annotation of genomic data, as well as the EC, this enzyme commission numbers for enzyme activity and the chemical entities of biological interest um, for small chemicals. Then we are at the different plant trade ontologies, an NCBI taxonomy for storing which crops we're actually having, then the crop ontology, and we have some internal KWS crop and trade ontology as well. And of course the plant ontology. Then we use a very specific German ontology, which is called BBCH, which is Biologisches Bundesanstalt, Bundessortenamt und Chemisches Industrie. It's basically for a range of crops they have identified similar growth stage and giving them the same BBCH code so you can kind of compare things across. I didn't know about this one either before I came to Germany. I think it's a very special one, but I kind of like the idea of having a cross crop uh, ontology. These things, of course, mostly for our omics metadata, for phenotyping data, and for field trial data. Then we have what I would call probably not an ontology, but for our locations, we have an internal vocabulary, very standardized for describing our field stations, where our field trials take place. Uh, of course, we then have real geospatial data, environmental ontologies, and um, to handle the specific locations, environmental data for, from, for example, weather and sensor data, and they can come in many formats. 
especially when you use different types of sensors or different brands, different weather data gathering uh, sources. So for there, we also have different ontologies to try to standardize these things. All of that we're trying to bind into our knowledge graph. This is, maybe, this is of course, an ideal picture, but the idea is that we can bind things through different nodes and edges across our knowledge graph to go from sequence to field trial and then um, enhance it with different legacy data and other auxiliary information like literature, patterns, provenance data, evidence codes, um, and thereby increasing what we can actually do with the data. One of the things we also have a kind of, I wouldn't say ontology, but a kind of internal vocabulary is to describe these knowledge graphs. Because if you use these kind of graph-based or triple stores, other NoSQL databases, they're very flexible. They don't require a schema, but it also means that people can write things, very similar things, but very phrased slightly different. Like if you have a gene and you have a paper citing it, if you don't structure it, some people would maybe write cited by as the connection or mentioned by or citing. And that can give a lot of confusion and basically uh, go against the purpose of being able to computationally uh, traverse these graphs automatically. So we also have developed a kind of internal vocabulary for connections in our knowledge graph. Um, one of the things we're using it for is a kind of knowledge base with a central access point. So we have a wide range of silos with different mappings. And then for the end user, we have an API, a standardized API endpoint where the user specifies what data he wants with what thresholds, what formats, and then our different mapping technologies take care that he gets the right data in the same format. We also, that allows us to build like a common user interface uh, where they can query it basically like a shopping mart, a data mart for aggregating this kind of data. That allows us to reuse when we develop different visualizations or analysis tools, they can then more, more easily be reused because things come in the same format, at least we try to. Um, and of course, having access to all this gives us a great advantage when we want to develop machine learning models because we can suddenly query a lot of data that might be relevant for developing this model. I will try to give us a short like demo of how we would build the knowledge graphs for our gene discovery by identifying possible new candidate genes for giving trade. This could for example be drought or um, more yield, you often need to find, uh, integrate very many different data types and knowledge graphs are an ideal way, in my opinion, for allowing for this kind of semantic aggregation. So we would store different triples or um, nodes and edges as you decide how you want to see it. But if you look here, then the colored words they could be seen as either nodes or the subject predicate with the black text being the relationship or predicate. Um, most of these words would then be from an ontology. So you, have, you would have an experiment conducted with an internal genotype, testing for trade, the trade of course from an on, one of our trade ontologies. So they can be traversed, having certain measurements, also from a standardized measurement ontology. And then all the way down to which measurements measures what gene, and then in the end, we can then start to try to infer new edges in this graph with this gene might be a potential target gene um, for a given trade. You could of course to also visualize it like as a small graph. You would have the blue experiment connected with the genotype, the trade, the measurement, this example is for microarrays, but it could also be for our sequencing or for any other measurements. And then we could start based on our internal inference algorithms to try to gather, okay, this means it has positive evidence from this experiment for this trade. 
then it's a potential target gene for this trait. Um, this way we can also then aggregate data from many other sources like QTLs literature, autologs across crops. So this is one way at least looking at it. For the technologies that we're using at KWS, um, I think we, we so most of our semantic data is stored in a triple store and most of our measurement data is stored in a classical relational oracle database as well as a lot of legacy data. Then we are using new 4 j as well for graph-based data, for example, protein interaction networks and other network-based data. Then we have we are trying to build RESTful API access for most parts, but we also for the triple store has a lot of work with Sparkle for querying it. Um, we are trying to build more microservice-based architecture, but um, that takes time also to identify actually the needs for where, how to build the APIs for what exactly people need. Um, yeah, so from our side, linked data is, we like it quite a lot. Um, for example, if, since you don't have these connecting tables, you don't have to worry if the IDs are matching. And if you have linked it to the same ontology, you can then trace it and traverse things very far so we use both ontologies for the metadata as well as for the connections in our SQL, NoSQL databases, which allows like us to very flexibly add new types of data when they become available. Um, this could, for example, be electronic lab notebooks, or if some people suddenly come with some old data they would like to integrate somehow, then we can easier build something. Also, since it's structured, we can prototype new projects very easily. I think one of the challenges we have is, of course, dealing with legacy data, but next to that, it's the mapping across ontologies and how to evaluate quality of mappings. Like, how do you go from some part of the gene ontology to a trait ontology? Some of them might be related, for example, with cold stress and generalization, but how do you find a good mapping to translate things across ontologies is something where we still uh, definitely have something to learn and work to do. And then there is the, I think Stephanie has also mentioned like the application and especially the maintenance of ontologies is very time consuming. Thank you very much, Björgen and Stephanie. Now we are at our question and comment session for the webinar. Okay, so maybe we can start with Elizabeth. And yeah, I had uh, two questions for Stephanie. You mentioned that uh, for BASF, it was a, a new domain. And uh, so I, will, I wanted just to know if you had to acquire uh, new expertise in your team to be able to create uh, your um, uh, traits and uh, ontology and use the ontologies, what was your the new expertise you needed to work on seeds and traits? So what I presented was um, what's, what had been running for several years within Bayer and which we uh, took along with us to, to BSF, so specifically for seeds and traits, um, not much changed except for uh, myself taking over from, from Eric and, and colleagues. Um, what is what is new to BSF is, is, is ontologies in other domains of their activities um, and, and there um, I'm working together um, with, with colleagues from, from different areas um, to, to have a broader use of, of ontologies in BSF. Um, so there we're, we're also looking into opportunities for, for synergies across uh, the organization, uh, for instance, for, for species or, or um, something or, or sequences, something which is it's more commonly used across uh, different domains. Yes, thank you, Stephanie. And Francoise, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? So I'm from INRAE, France. Um, so it's a national uh, institute for um, research in agriculture, alimentation and environment now. <laughs> Food and environment, so perhaps you know. Yeah, well, so I, I was wondering what, what kind of, of um, 
what what would be your expectation from from um, the academic uh, people working in academic institutes? What kind of collaboration you you would see um, to enhance um, this kind of of data science? So I I, I was thinking on on um, data standardization, you can build your own vocabulary, your own knowledge graph with your own way of standardizing it. But I was wondering if, if, if you are also expecting some um, collaboration about that um, uh, with the academic uh, uh, world. Yeah, so from my perspective, uh, for sure, um, we try as much as possible to uh, to rely on, on public efforts. Um, so regarding uh, ontologies itself, whenever uh, an ontology such as a plant ontology or trait ontology is publicly available, that's, that would be our starting point, and then we try to expand where necessary. Uh, but also regarding standards, um, we try to build on, on standards that, that are established in the public domain. Um, I think we we do need to find a, a better way of, of, of aligning that and, and coordinating that such that, um, that the interaction can go both ways and that we can um, uh, build on, on things uh, together. Um, Thing there, it's it's sometimes a, a bit difficult as as a company to um, to bring back the efforts that we done internally to the public domain. But in the end, I think this is is only benefiting the whole the whole community, uh, and and that allows us to to focus on things which are really specific to our R and D activities. Uh, So yeah, I think more specifically, yeah. and I think that's what what Bjorn also uh, mentioned is yeah is is like standards around predicates and and how you model data schemas and that kind of thing. So terminology which which allow which yeah further supports data integration. I would say is is still to some extent missing. Yeah, I agree, and I, I think this would definitely be a community effort, preferably industry, together with the university, not just because it's a humongous effort to standardize these things, but also to make sure that you really get a point of view from many different types of people, um, which I think is, if you do it like in these kind of like CGIR consortium or similar, then you really have a variety of people that can contribute instead of people just sitting at KWS, we don't work with let's say chemicals but maybe we can learn something from there and vice versa so i think it's very very important if we could have even better com collaborations outside thank you very much great thank you very much um Sirara, you have a, a question would you like to unmute yourself to ask it um yeah thank you so it's probably more of the follow-up questions to the previous questions um in your pipeline of the curation so my understanding is that for your curators once you receive the 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 the, the terms request from the users what is the process here are the curators mapping to other ontologies or are they just trying to curate the in-house ontologies with their own um terms with their own standards so I, I hear the two talks and i know that um in in the knowledge graph Bjorn is using some of the obo foundry ontologies and then just the previous comments is really to find this bridge between um the industry and the academic partners so I was just wondering if you're trying to create a brand new ontology or you're trying to reuse some other ontologies and try to find a sweet spot as well yeah, so it's a combination of, of both. So in some cases, uh, we work on, on private ontologies, so things that we build from, from scratch and which are very specific to 
to our activities. Uh, I think um, Bjorn mentioned that as well. Locations, for instance, to describe the, the sites that we have, where, for instance, field trials are, are performed. Um, on the other hand, wherever there is something publicly available, such as as, as the trait ontology, we, we start from what is publicly available, and then the curation process is to, to add specific ontology terms to that public um, ontology, such that we can cover the traits that, that are of relevance to, to us. So there we, we need a process where we take in the public ontologies, merge them with our private uh, curation and, and release that um, in the platform. Yeah, great. Uh, Elizabeth, you have a question linked to this one, I think? Yeah, in fact, um, just to be a bit more into the details of the collaboration between uh, the, your enterprise and the, the public sector developing the ontologies, you, you, show, you showed Stephanie uh, a slide where we can see you have a workflow and you have a form for your users to submit new terms or request uh, the modification. And this goes uh, to your curators and this is an internal workflow. So I was curious to know how you link that internal workflow to, to a workflow that could help um, you, your curators, to submit your new terms back to the public ontology you're using, like plant ontology, trait ontology, crop ontology. Is there any mechanism you have or you plan to have or we should discuss? Thank you. I think this is something to, to discuss. Um, I, I think, yeah, I would like to explore how we, how we can more closely work together on extending um, those kind of ontologies. So for now, we we have not uh, foreseen that. Um, so we we do not bring back the the changes to to the public uh, version at this point. Um, mainly for time reasons, I think. Um, but on the other hand, I think we also need to see, need to see how how we can efficiently do that. Um, the other opportunity that I see to work together is to really, uh, for instance, for trades, but also in plant ontology to to kind of yeah re revise um, the structure of the ontology as is today uh, to make sure that it's it's even yeah it's even better than then then yeah how how it's structured today sometimes yeah you see some conflict conflicts or, or very redundant terms and, and things like that so that's also an area that for sure we cannot handle ourselves so where we would look into part partnering with um, with external um, contributors okay i think perhaps this uh, community of practice could be a good venue to discuss this kind of collaboration and bring yeah, more hands behind. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Um, next, next question is from Karen. W would you like to unmute yourself to ask it? Yes, thank you. Um, I was thinking about the uh, what you mentioned at the end. One of the one of the challenges might be crosswalks between ontologies, and I'm wondering what the infrastructures would look like to have a type of crosswalk service or any of the if if you knew of any good examples or best practices in place that were already doing similar types of things um to be honest that's why it's one of our challenges we we definitely have something to learn there um some of our internal things is that we have a lot of internal vocabulary as well that we need to have mapped up that and that at the moment is being done manually which of course is very time consuming i could imagine um, that some of it could be done with some kind of basically text recognition as well because hopefully the words should be quite similar and then have another structured ontology for mapping these things up to um, but to be honest that's a field where we definitely need to to work more and i don't have a a good solution for that. Um, so if someone have a very nice suggestion, I would be very willing to to listen. 
sadly, we don't. Hi, thank you. Um, Micheline, you wanted to ask a, a question to Bjorn. Oh, uh, yes, uh, hello, thank you, Celine. Uh, Bjorn, I, I was trying to find the BBC H um, uh, database you mentioned. I somehow could find um, mentions of it in Wikipedia and different websites, but not on one single website. And I was wondering if it is a private database or it is a public database. To my understanding, it should be a public database, but I'm not the one who's maintaining it at ours, so I don't know exactly where they get it from. I would appreciate it if you have a source, if you can um, send me the link. Otherwise, I will try <laughs> and, and keep looking for it. Thank you. This is Anne Francoise. My, my understanding about BBCH is that it was um, a series of publication initially. You could find it only in PDF. And it was made by community of people who were specialists of several crops. So you have a BBCH scale for each, each crop. And now uh, the community working on each crop is progressively trying to put it into um, something which is more machine readable. Um, and, and so I'm, I don't think there is a centralized BBCH um, machine readable um, database. And it's, it's a bit tricky to put it into a, a, a machine readable. Well, you have several ways of doing this. And it may occur that the different crop communities would translate this slightly differently <laughs> or put it in different ways. Marie Angelique maybe knows more. Yeah, I, I see she said that they, uh, some of it or part of it have been mapped to the plant ontology. So I will take a look at that. Otherwise, what I will do, like I used to do with the Zadox scale, is just have it printed in a PDF. Well, thank you very much because I did not know this existed. Uh, I have not done active research in plants for a while, and I think this is this is a good effort. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, exchange. So, Jakob, you had a, a question about uh, public ontologies. Hi, Celine. Yeah, so my question, I wrote in the chat as well. Um, so what would be good incentives for people to um, increase their contribution to the public ontologies and kind of feedback what is created in, uh, in companies to the public pool of, uh, of ontologies in general? So I, I would think that if you, in companies, if you use public data or data generated by other uh, companies, then it makes sense to also start contributing to a, a common good, right, uh, ontology. So you, you make uh, yourself more interoperable as well. Um, if you can benchmark your own procedures against what other companies have or uh, use part of their data, exchange data, then I would see very clear incentives. So I, I wonder how that is in, in for each of your situations, whether it does make sense is there an incentive to, to be more compatible with others in that sense, or is it only an internal benefit for your company? Well, yeah, I think in the past um, for the sequence ontology, we, we did report back our, um, our changes to, to the public sequence ontology uh, community. Um, from data experience, I think we have to admit that uh, the process was quite lengthy uh, in time. Um, so I think that is something to to for sure take into account that um, that it goes relatively quickly and, and there's not too much back and forth. So that's on the practical side. Um, advantages are, are for sure that um, the less you divert from a, a public uh, ontology, the, the easier it is uh, to maintain also um, uh, on the side of the company. Um, so that's, that's of course uh, a benefit. But um, yeah, I must admit that it's, it's not straightforward to have a, yeah, a really good, good incentive there. 
I mean, yeah, benefits are, are often indirect. Jan, you are working with Björn. Maybe you can answer the question if you have anything to, to say. Um, yeah, so for us, it's really uh, reusing uh, public annotated data and combining it with internal data. So this is kind of for us the initiative of uh, being able to uh, contribute to the development of uh, public ontologies. Uh, so it's then the, the resulting community uh, effort. And I think uh, Björn is back online. Yeah, sorry, I lost yes. completely. Best incentive for us to participate is that it's a big effort to lift alone, and we definitely would better get get a better um, result by working together. Thank you. There, there was also a question from Bodo. Hi, hi, uh, morning. This is Bodo from Fiat in Colombia. I was wondering. I mean, you're you're developing a lot of very valuable resources here, and, and what investments do you do in creating user interfaces for that, or training people that are not experts in all this to be able to really use it, so that you have a biggest possible impact with all the work you do? Yeah, so from, from the BSF side, um, so I, sh I showed a, a few examples of, of interfaces of applications um, where, where people um, can annotate their data using ontology terms. So, so that's typically uh, the way how we try to make it as straightforward as possible. Such that that people don't need to deal with the whole ontology, not with a tree structure, but that they they have a form where they can type something in. It auto completes against the ontology, and then they, they get suggestions on on terms to choose. So yeah, I think that's the for now the the best approach. Um, we have also other approaches. Um, such where we work with with templates uh, that people need to fill in um, but in in general i think what what is most important is that um yeah that it's straightforward that people don't have to go first to another website or for tool to find an ontology term and then um and then uh, yeah have to transfer it to to yet another database or or input formats and Do you have to invest a lot in training to make all this work? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's what I wanted to, uh, to say. So around training, um, I think it does take time for people to familiarize. We have not invested too much time in, in really dedicated trainings, um, but we, we did try to guide people in, in using the applications and in, yeah, in annotating data sets. Um, such that they, they become familiar um, with the ontologies that they need for, for their data sets. Okay, well, thank you, Stephanie. Elisabeth, you have a, a question for Bjorn. I just uh, wanted to know, Bjorn, for your knowledge graph, how many, how many data points or data, data sets your knowledge graph is handling at the moment? We store a lot of our molecular data, like functional annotations and stuff, in it as well. Uh, I think I remember the exact number, but it's, it's a good bit more than a billion points at the moment with the for the for the virtuoso triple store. But that way, that but that kind of triple store is basically stru structured. So you have different graphs inside the graphs, so you can traverse them across. But of course, we can also easily like, for cleaning up sometimes and uh, updating handle it but yeah, i think it's like one one billion 1.5 billion data points at the moment okay okay sorry i don't Thank have you. a perfect yeah. updated it's, number no, but it's, uh, to have uh, just an, an average an idea of the amount of data points thank you Bill. Uh, i can see that you have some comments for stephanie and Bjorn. do you want to discuss it uh, with with us uh, no, it's just it's just FYI, and just in case it it, it may help. So what um, Stephanie mentioned earlier for the lag time of requesting new terms from from other public ontologies. Um, so there is an approach ca uh, called application ontology, 
um, that you can reuse their code. And basically what it is, is to try to aid the integration between the public ontologies and your in-house ontologies. Um, you could try to, to use the design pattern, the relationship um, properties, and then so if there are needs for new terms, but you don't want to wait for, for, for other people to make new terms for you, at least um, with this approach, you will be following the same semantic structure uh, so that in the future, should you need to integrate with the, the, the other data, uh, it, 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 it could accommodate that. So just, just throwing an idea there. Um, and for Bjorn, I know that you just mentioned um, some large scale data mapping are still challenging for the, the curation part of it. So there are, there are also tools that I put the link there um, that they have made the, the mapping by ID, mapping by uh, text search and mapping by looking into the existing mappings um, knowledge base. Um, so just sharing some information that I have, I'm happy to connect you with the developers. I don't own any of those. I just know that um, that there are tools out there. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I have had a look once before at some of them, but it's always, I definitely should have a deeper look into it as well. But that goes back to this, uh, I can't remember if that is also mentioned on the EBI page, but then if you do it automatically, what is the what is a good mapping and what is a bad Bad mapping and how to define that is also important uh, can, because then yeah I can I can connect you with the developers um, if you drop me an email yeah sounds very nice thank you very yeah. much okay so we are right on time thank you a lot for the presenters for this great presentation and the great exchange we are just after it I will hand it over to Elizabeth. So I wish to thank uh, our two speakers who prepared very nice presentation. I always appreciate uh, the time and the quality that our speakers are providing to those webinars. So from the first webinar and the second, the first was with Bayer Crop Science, uh, Eric, Antezana, and Yes Solander, and this one. We start to understand better how the the agricultural enterprises are using the ontologies and are not uh, into the knowledge graph uh, development, which I think we can also get inspired on our side. And we understand better how uh, our community could help also for all the, the collaboration between the private and the public sector uh, for making those ontologies reliable, uh, complete, because there are some uh, gaps and have a, a way to have uh, the, the mappings that were discussed um, uh, of good quality. So I think uh, it was a, a good uh, discussion. I can see also that some of the points that you raise about the, the um, time consuming activity in data cleaning, um, the, the collaborations, um, or the time for maintaining the ontologies are like an echo to the webinar uh, with Bayer Crop Science. So it's a nice series because we are building some key statements through, through those discussion. Thank you all for your attendance. And if you want to contact Celine or I, our uh, email addresses are on the Big Data Platform uh, website. Thank you.